have you ever felt like uh, year after year you just kind of remained in the same place over and over? You ever felt like that where it's like you get to the end of one year, move into the next, it feels like you're in the same exact place you started uh, the year before. It feels like nothing's changing. You feel like uh, you're not, it's, it's like no progress is being made. Have you ever felt like that? And then, you know, you're, you're sitting there frustrated. You're like, you know, I know I'm supposed to be seeing increase. I know I'm supposed to be growing. I know I'm supposed to be going to another level, but what am I doing? How do I get the progress? How do I get things to actually move forward? Have you ever felt like that? That's what this is about tonight. This is what I'm talking about. And I can remember this was, this was how it was for me. Um, there was a time for Carolyn and I in our ministry where, especially financially, it felt like we were, we were hitting a glass ceiling over and over and over. And uh, it felt like we just couldn't break through that glass ceiling to go to the next level. And it was extremely irritating to me because, you know, we were fasting, praying. Of course, we were givers and everything like that, uh, tithers and givers. And it felt like we just kept hitting this one place where we couldn't break past it. And there's nothing more frustrating than feeling like uh, you're not moving forward. Nothing more frustrating than feeling like there's no progress. And especially when you understand that that is what your life should look like. There should be growth. There should be progress all the time. And if you're a part of the kingdom, there should be never-ending increase in your life, your business, your ministry, your family. And so obviously that would be frustrating to anybody. And I remember that um, we went to a crusade that Bishop David Oyedepo was holding in uh, Washington, D.C. I'd seen him once before in Queens, New York, and uh, he came back to Washington, D.C., and he rented this dog track, and he had all of these different uh, pastors from around the country that were a part of his denomination visiting, and I felt in my spirit, first of all, I was irritated because the last time I saw him, um, I didn't have a checkbook with me. Now, I don't carry a checkbook. My wife does. And um, there was no way for me to sow into Bishop Oedepo personally. And I was irritated about that. And I can remember saying, next time I see him, I am not missing the opportunity to bless this man of God. So uh, we went to D.C. And um, uh, as the service came to an end, uh, he was getting ready to go. And I wanted to make sure that I had something. Plus, his birthday was coming up. But I had this in my, in my spirit that our ministry is not going to stay the same. It's, we're not going to continue on the same path, hitting that same glass ceiling. And so uh, my wife and I talked, and we, we knew in our spirit what to do. And I said, we're going to sow a $10,000 seed into Bishop Oyedepo personally, not into his church, not into his ministry. We're going to sow it into him personally. And I'm going to believe God that we're going to see a breakthrough in our life and ministry. That was the plan. And so I can remember that when we did that, he was leaving. He was literally walking out of the, it was kind of like a tunnel, like, you know, those, those sports arenas kind of have those tunnels where teams come out and it was like a tunnel kind of entrance for the dog track. And he was leaving and everybody was sitting there like waiting to see him go. And he came walking through the tunnel. And as he walked by, I just kind of handed him that envelope. And I said, God bless you, Bishop. Happy birthday. And he was very gracious. He said, thank you very much. And he was just on his way out to the car. And I remember after that day, our ministry went to another level, went to another place. And we never went backwards after that. I can remember that was something that broke me through to the next level of ministry financially, that after we sowed that seed into Bishop Oyedepo, we never regressed. We never went backwards and uh, continued to grow. And then, of course, where we are today, absolutely mind-boggling. I mean, it's like literally, you, you couldn't explain it any other way than to say it's a supernatural thing, God's hand that moves you forward. And so there are certain decisions you have to make in life. There are certain steps that you have to take, and uh, God will lead you, of course, by his spirit, but there are practical things that you can do that most Christians will not do. They just simply won't in order to move forward. And so that's why uh, I wanted to talk to you and give you these 15 um, crucial changes that have to be made. You have to make them. There's no, there's no question about it. If you want to continue to move forward or you've not been moving forward at all, 
Now's the time before we get ready to get into a new year to employ these changes and watch as you literally move forward. And I'm believing with you that you'll see a, a huge momentum on your life, your business, your ministry, whatever it is you're believing for. I'm going to believe you're going to see a huge momentum as you are doing these things. But let me break these down for you. And it's going to help you a lot. I hope you're taking notes. Um, for those of you that are watching later, I'm going to put some timestamps in here so that you can get through these and, and check them out. But number one, if you're putting it, put them in the comments as you're, as you're watching me, number one, the first change that you have to make is you've got to give yourself clear destinations. You have to give yourself clear destinations. This is a biblical principle, by the way. This is not some kind of a business or self-help principle. This is a biblical principle. You've got to give yourself clear destinations. And what do I mean by that? You have to know where you're headed spiritually, where you want to be mentally, where you want to be physically, where you want to be financially, and where you want to be relationally. And I, I truly believe those are the five areas of your life that you have to master, without question. Your spiritual life, your mental life, your physical life, your financial life, your relational life. And you have to have a clear, where am I headed? Where am I going? Where do I want to be? Um, I love what uh, Bishop Oyedepo says regarding that. He said, if you don't know where you're going, anywhere you arrive looks like your destination. If you don't know where you're going, Anywhere you arrive looks like your destination. You've got to have clear, defined goals of where I'm headed. You know, what, what would be a success to me? Like, you know, for my spiritual life in, in this uh, upcoming year, what do I want to see take place spiritually for me? What do I want to see my mind look like in this upcoming year? How, is there something going on in my body? Do, do I want my physical life, my health, my physical fitness, whatever it might be, you know, your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. What do I want different from my physical body? What do I want different from my finances? What do I want to be different from my relationships? Those five areas have to be mastered. And so you've got to give yourself clear destinations. I mean, as far as you need to write it down, you need it, it needs to be so clear that if somebody were to ask you at any given moment, you'd be able to clearly define what it is that you're believing for in that area of your life. And I would, if you don't have, um, you know, those things already set aside, I would just make a list with those five categories. Honestly, make a list with those five categories, spiritual, mental, physical, financial, relational, and then set a goal for each one in this upcoming year. Where do I want to be in all those five categories of my life in those five areas? Because I like what my, my uncle, uh, evangelist Tiff Shuttlesworth says, he said, it's hard to hit a target that you can't see, but it's impossible to hit a target that you don't have. It's hard to hit a target you can't see, but it's impossible to hit a target that you don't have. That's why you've got to make it clear, clear destinations. What does the Bible say? It says without vision, one translation, without prophetic vision, people cast off restraint. One translation, older translation says they perish, but truly what it means is they cast off restraint. And what that, if you want to break that down, what it actually means is if you don't have a goal, if you don't know where you're headed, then there's nothing to restrain you from doing anything, right? If I'm driving my car to a certain location, then I know that I can't just drive on any road. I can't just get on any interstate. If I'm going to a specific place, there are specific roads I've got to drive in order to get to that destination. Now, if I don't have a destination in mind, I can just go for a joy ride, but that's not productive. That's not productive. I've got to have a destination and I have to know that there are parameters set on my life to get me there. That's vital. There are parameters on my life to get me where I'm going. So number one, give yourself clear destinations. Number two, this is very important. I never fully got this until this year. I had it backwards. And number two is this, ration your focus. Ration, just like the army, you know, would ration out food or ration out water. Ration 
your focus. You've probably heard it said, you know, like multiple times, you know, time is your greatest resource or time, you know, or, you know, people say time is money or, you know, time's your greatest resource. In, in all reality, time is actually not your greatest resource. Your greatest resource, if you think about it, is actually your focus. Think about that for a minute. Time's not your greatest resource. Time will pass no matter what. But your focus is a limited, uh, it's, it's really a limited resource because you can't focus indefinitely. Focus runs out just like willpower runs out. So you have to ration your focus. Very important thought here. Get this. Because no matter what, time will pass. You know, you can spend, if you want to, you can spend nine hours on a project. But you're not going to be able to focus unless you're superhuman. You're not going to be able to focus for nine straight hours on a project. Your focus fades and then your focus will be broken. And so you have to ration your focus. Ration your focus. What do I mean by that? What I mean is you have to understand what's actually important in your life. What's actually important in your life? One thing that happens a lot now, there's a lot of things that are actually fighting for our attention, fighting for our, uh, our, our focus, for lack of a better term. There's so much pulling at you, so much all the time, that you can't give yourself to everything and then expect to still move forward. It doesn't work that way. You have to limit your focus to only what's important. Because remember, if your focus is a limited resource, why would you expend it on things that do not matter? That happens with people every single day. That's why there's people that, uh, you know, they planned to start a business four years ago. It's still not started. There's people that planned, you know, to write a book or they plan whatever it is. And they planned it four or five years ago and it's still not done. You see them five years later. You ask them, hey, did you ever write that book? Oh, I'm, you know, I'm still working. No, it's because they've not rationed their focus. Everything else is stealing their attention. And so as a result, their focus runs out on things that are not productive and things that don't matter. That's not God's plan for your life. God's plan for your life is for you to attack your purpose and to accomplish what he's given you to do with excellence and with, his, with the force of his momentum behind you. You can't do that without rationing your focus. You can't focus on everything. It's not even worth focusing on everything. Focus on the right things. Focus on the right things. Number three will help you as well. Number three is important. This is something called, and you can write it this way, the no-yes ratio. And the way I wrote it in my notes, no forward slash yes ratio. The no-yes ratio. Say, so what do you mean by that? You have to take stock in your life, whether it's your personal life, your business, your ministry, your family, whatever it might be. You need to take stock of what's working, what's actually producing fruit, what's moving you forward. Take stock of those things and then look at everything. What things are kind of making you feel like you're spinning your wheels? What things seem like a waste of time? What things aren't producing anything for you of value? And then you have to be willing to say actually a lot of no's, a lot of no's, because what ends up happening when you say no to the right things, it actually makes room for the right things. Saying no to the right things makes room for you to say yes to the right things. And really, not everything's for you. Not everything is for you. And I put it in that way for a reason, the no-yes ratio. The reason I put it in like that is because no should actually be, be said more than yes, if you think about it. No should be said more than yes. Just because just because I can do something doesn't mean I should do something. Please put that in the comments. Just because I can do something doesn't mean I should do something. Not everything's for me. Not everything's for you. And so if you can clearly identify, as I said, what your focus should be on, if we're rationing our focus, if I can clearly identify what my focus should be on, then there's a lot of things that I can quickly say no to. Quickly say no to. That's very, very important. You know, 
If not, you'll run around like a chicken with your head cut off trying to accomplish everything, and actually, you'll accomplish nothing. There's a Russian proverb that actually says, a man who chases two rabbits catches none. A man who chases two rabbits catches none. I think it's Gary Keller that included that in his book, The One Thing. I think that's the author of The One Thing, Gary Keller. Excellent book. If you've never read it, you should read it. But a man who chases two rabbits catches none. Multitasking is truly a lie. You've got to set your focus on something and stay there. And the way that you can keep yourself moving forward steadily is by identifying the things God's given you to do and then saying no to the things that don't matter. You know, when I was just out of Bible school, in fact, I think I was finishing Bible school still, I went to my great-grandmother's funeral uh, in northern Maine. And when I was there, there was an old man of God who literally just recently went to heaven. And um, he had done a lot for the Lord. And I stopped him that day in the funeral home and I said, uh, or the church, and I said, you know, pastor, if you could go back and tell the 20-year-old version of yourself one thing, what would it be? What would you tell yourself all these years later? And he, he didn't even hesitate. He didn't even hesitate. He said, I would tell myself to find out what God wants me to do and only do that thing for the rest of my life. That was powerful. Find out what God wants me to do and only do that thing for the rest of my life. What, what do you have to be able to do to do that? You have to be able to say no to a lot of things that are available to you so that you can say yes to the right things. I mean, I'm, I'm, I told the Lord, I remember saying this clearly. You know, if you don't know my story, I have, you know, a lot of people uh, around me that are ministers. Everyone in my family is a minister. All of my uncles, my grandfather was a minister. All my cousins are ministers. I mean, everybody in my family is a minister. And there are multiple people in my family that are on Christian television. And I told the Lord very clearly, I am not going on Christian television just because there's all these other ministers in my family that are on Christian television. I said, I'm not going to do it unless you specifically tell me to, and then you open the door. I refuse. I'm not doing it because everybody else is doing it. I will not live that way. And I can remember, I put it off and put it off and put it off. And then God started open, opening the doors himself. And when he did, he did more for me by me saying no to when it wasn't the right time than I could have done myself by trying to pursue it with everything I had when it wasn't God's plan at the time. I remember recently, uh, this was just maybe a, a year and a half ago, I was preaching at uh, our old home church here in um, Margate, Florida, Abundant Life, and they said, there's a man who's come to see you, and he's the manager for Christian Television Network. And uh, afterwards, he spoke to me. He said, you know, we'd really like to get your program on Christian Television Network. And uh, at this point, I was really only on overseas, 180 nations of the world. And I said, well, yeah, you know, we're launching the church there. And uh, he said, yeah, I know. And it would be great to get your TV program on in West Palm Beach. I said, all right. I said, well, we'll definitely uh, talk about it. We'll pray about it. The next morning, I was uh, going up to West Palm Beach to have breakfast with one of the people that was going to become a member of our church, I sit down. I mean, of all the places I could go in West Palm Beach to have breakfast, I sit down in this one restaurant uh, with my wife and the person that was going to be attending our church, and I look to my right, and right to my right is this same man that just saw me the day before at a church that was 35, 40 minutes away. And we looked at each other like, what in the world are you doing here? And he said, thought the same about me. And we jumped up and hugged. He said, this is God, Brother Ted. This is God. And I, I knew it was. God was opening the door. God was opening up the door. And now, I believe we're on that station, what is it, like 17 times a week. They play us like 17 times a week with the replays. We're on seven days a week, but I think our program plays 17 times a week with the replays. It's, it's absolutely supernatural. I couldn't have lined that up, but God lined it up. God did it. And I told the Lord, unless you're going to do it. And then of course, what just happened, you know, with 
uh, DirecTV with this brand new Christian network that covers all of the United States, 13 and a half million homes. I couldn't have put that all together. But the Lord opened the doors. God opened the doors. So you've got to be able to say no to the right things in order to be, be able to say yes to the right things. So the no yes ratio, number three, the no yes ratio is critical if you're going to see growth because you can't run around doing everything and expect to be great and efficient at the right thing. You can't. You'll become a jack of all trades and a master of none, as the old phrase goes. A jack of all trades and a master of none. Number four, the fourth crucial change you've got to make to level up in 2024 is you've got to scrub your friends list. Scrub your friends list. I was recently watching a... Um, an email marketing video and they were talking about e email marketing. And one of the things that they always tell you to do is every so often you want to scrub your email list. There's people that no longer care to receive emails from you. They no longer care to hear from you. They don't respond, you know, whatever. They just have not ever unsubscribed. But if you can go back over a year and you see nobody's opened your email for a full year, they probably don't want to receive your emails anymore. So they tell you that it's good to scrub that list so that you're only sending emails to the people that want to see them. And uh, the more I listened to that uh, video about scrubbing your email list, I kept thinking about scrubbing your friends list because I thought, you know what? There's tons of people in the body of Christ that literally have carried people with them even from before they were saved. They've never severed those connections They've got people that are still actively trying to pull them back into a life of sin. They've got people that are truly weighing them down to keep, keep them from uh, accomplishing their purpose. And there's people that, as the Bible uh, calls it, are unequally yoked with an unbeliever, unequally linked up with an unbeliever. There are plenty of people that you don't have any business hanging with anymore. And then even in the body of Christ, there's people, if they don't want to move forward, you know, if you believe that um, principle that that really is true, that you become the average of the five people you spend the most time with, if you believe that, then why would you be so flippant in who you allow to be the five closest people in your life? Don't be flippant with it. Surround yourself with people of like faith, but people that are pushing forward, people that are producing, people that want to get things done, people that are full of faith, people that are encouraging to you. I wrote this down, you know, stop being the motivated one in the group. Stop being the churchy one. You know, if you're just like, oh yeah, he's, he goes to church, all that. Why do, why do none of your other friends go to church? Why are, your, why are none of your other friends productive? Why are you always looked at as the productive one? Why are you always looked at as the motivated one? You see what I mean? Don't be the only one in your group that's producing. Don't be the only one in your group that cares about the Bible and cares about Jesus and cares about going to church. Don't be the only one in your group that uh, desires to make more and, uh, of, of your life and to go further than we, where you are right now. There's plenty of people that are satisfied to stay right where they are. Don't be that person. You're not called to stay right where you are. You're called to go higher. And so you might need to just go in and take a look at your friends list and say, are, are, are these people really supposed to be in my life? Are there people actively dragging me back into a life of disobedience? Are there people that are actively dragging me back into a life where I'm not productive? You know, you need to take, take a close look at that because let me tell you, relationships matter a lot. Rel you know, you've heard the term guilty by association. I don't want, not only do I not want to be guilty by association, I don't want to be unproductive by association, unholy by association, unhealthy by association. I have no desire. Absolutely no desire. And so I'm going to scrub my friends list. I'm making sure not everybody has access to my personal time. Not everybody should have access to your personal time. Make a decision and say, from this day forward, I'm going to be very guarded about who I allow in my life, who I allow around my family. I'm telling you, it'll make a massive difference. Number five, put it down. 
Less mindless scrolling, more mindful learning. That's number five. Less mindless scrolling, more mindful learning. If there's anything that takes up our time in this day and age, it's mindless scrolling. There's a lot of different names for it. In fact, because of the way that it's affected people's minds, um, some are calling it doom scrolling. Doom scrolling because psychologists have found out it's causing heaviness. It's causing depression. But don't allow your time to be wasted with mindless scrolling. In, instead, I, and I'm talking about people that really want to move forward. People want to level up in this upcoming year. Instead of that, what I'm encouraging you to do is set time aside for purposeful increase of knowledge and wisdom. Set time aside. Purposeful increase of knowledge and wisdom. You've got to do it. Less mindless scrolling, more mindful learning. Develop your mind. Number six, develop your mind through, now get this, because I know there's a lot of people that don't like to read, through reading or listening. It's number six. Develop your mind through reading or listening. It's all right. If you want to do an audio book over, you know, reading a book or, you know, Kindle, whatever, that's fine. Do what you got to do through reading or listening. But here's what I would caution you about. There's people that just, they really just love to put on podcasts, to, you know, kind of like tune them out in the background. There's pr people they like to listen to, people that may make them laugh, and that's fine. There's room for entertainment in anybody's life, but, but get this. There's so much that can go on to autopilot. There's so much that can go on to cruise control that it's, it's a major mistake to just allow yourself to just coast through entertainment after entertainment, uh, piece of content after piece of content. Instead of that, be very, what's the best way to say it? Be very selective about what you will put in front of your eyes. Be very selective about what you will put in your ears. In fact, this is another one of those things that I would say before you go into this upcoming year, I would make a list set goals and make a list of what you want to have read or listened to by the end of the year. Make a list. Don't just say, well, you know, I'll think of it as I go. Don't do that to yourself. Allow yourself to have a specific goal. I'm going to read, you know, whatever it is, these five books this year, these 10 books this year, these 12 books this year, get them on your list, get them in Kindle, get them in Audible, whatever you're going to do. And then set that time aside when you would normally be, you know, scrolling, when you normally be just like throwing on a podcast to laugh and push yourself, push your, you know, just by doing this, you'll be like in the top 5% of people that have left school because most people, when they leave college, they never continue to read or study to show themselves approved as the Bible says, they never study to increase themselves any longer. There's a very small percentage of people that continue to do that. But do you know something? All of the people who are successful in what they do, do that. No question about it. That's why we have the, the phrase, the term, uh, leaders are readers. Leaders are readers. I, I'm, I'll be very honest with you. I would much, much rather and I can tell you that this, this is, I do this now. I would much, much rather listen to an audio book that's going to help me learn something that's going to increase our ministry or, you know, whatever the business side of our ministry, whatever that is. I would a hundred percent rather listen to an audio book or read an ebook that's going to increase my knowledge for our ministry or for the business side of our ministry than I would to put on a, a musical playlist and just kind of zone out and listen to music. Now, I, and you know that I love music. I'm a musician. I'm a singer. I love music a lot, but I would so much rather, and that's why, and now that I'm saying this, I'm thinking of it, I don't ever really just sit around and listen to music. I mean, there's very, very few times, maybe driving to church, we'll put on praise and worship or whatever that might be, but I would so much rather either put headphones on, ear, uh, AirPods in, and listen to a book or read a book. Why? 
Because developing yourself, developing your mind is so crucial. This is number six. Develop your mind through reading and listening. You've got to do it. Choose your content wisely. Choose your content wisely. Number seven. This is big. This is actually very big. And it's funny. People don't think it's big. And I've not put a ton of uh, priority on this, and I should. And I'm going to do more than I have in the past. I've, I've taken steps. This is number seven. Don't neglect your physical health. Don't neglect your physical health. When you're young, you feel like you have all the time in the world. Nothing can stop you. Nothing can hurt you. You go hard. You, you, know, you eat whatever. But, but hear what I'm saying. <clears throat> Though this might sound like a super practical thing, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So you've got to take care of the temple of the Holy Spirit. One time, the Lord actually asked me a question in my spirit. He said, would you rather, do you think I would rather you uh, go hard and, and, and burn out and be a flash in the pan after 15 years? Or do you think I would rather you go and if Jesus tarries, uh, be productive for 80 years? And of course I knew the answer to that. He wants me to be productive for as long as I possibly can. There's no question. And what he was doing was convicting me about the way that I was taking care of myself, the way that I was going, the way that I was running. Because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you allow this body to break down, I don't care how powerful your spirit is. I don't care how smart you are. If the vehicle that carries your mind and your spirit around is allowed to be broken down by bad choices, well, of course there's healing from God. Of course there's miracles, but why should we have to depend on a miracle or a healing from God when we could use wisdom and take care of the temple of the Holy Spirit? And one of the things, and I, and I mean this, one of the things that uh, is going to help you, it's going to help you a lot, is people think that physical exercise for your body only affects your body, and that could not be further from the truth. Let me just say this. It needs to be said. People think physical exercise, even Paul the Apostle said, physical exercise profits a little. Now he was, but when he said that, he was comparing it to godly living. Well, of course, compared to godly living, physical exercise is just a small part. Godly living is everything. But physical exercise is nothing to be minimized because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. But remember something. People think it only affects your body. It does not only affect your body. We're finding out now, neuroscientists are finding out now, that there's all kinds of things that exercise does to your mind, to your hormones, even being outside and exercising, being in the sun. If you've never watched anything by uh, Dr. Andrew Huberman, watch it. Neuroscientist from California talks about what takes place when you get sunlight, what takes place when you begin to work your, work your body? What takes place when you exert yourself and your heart rate goes high? And what, what happens? How now there are hormones released in your body, actual feel-good hormones, endorphins, released in your body uh, because you are working your body out, taking care of your physical body. And so it actually is something that, actu that it'll work on your mind. People that'll do this, it actually moves depression further from you. People don't even, people don't even look into that, but it, it's mind-blowing that as you, I, I was just blown away just listening to him uh, rattle off these statistics and talk about it from the scientific and medical perspective, that as you spend time outside, God created the sun for you outside, working out your body, the things that happen internally are more than just my, my heart's more healthy. It's more than your heart being more healthy. It actually affects your mind. People that spend time, get that vitamin D, get the sunlight, get outside, exercise, exert themselves, they're actually happier people. Affects your mood. It's mind-blowing how it all works together. But again, if you don't have the fuel to carry out the thing God's called you to do, you might as well be in heaven now. If you're locked up in a room and you can't go anywhere, 
because you, you've so destroyed your body. So that's why I'm telling you, do not neglect your physical health. The more that you can do physically, the more productive you can be. The more you can scale your business, the more you can scale your ministry, the more you can take care of your family, the more memories you can make with your children. All of that is dependent upon using wisdom with your physical body. Number eight, this is big. Start a vision board. I, I believe in this. And, I, and I, I have things on my iPad. I don't, I don't make like an actual physical board. Some people do. Some people will put it up in their office, put it up in their bedroom, whatever it is, and they have clippings, they have pictures, they have things they've printed out, and they'll stick it on the actual board. Maybe you have that. But there's, it's important to keep things in front of your face. It's important to keep big things in front of your eyes. Don't just, you know, <clears throat> it's funny. It's like uh, when I was younger, thank God that I had the ability to travel with my parents. My father's an evangelist. My mother, they're evangelists, full-time traveling, still traveling. And when I was, you know, a child, I traveled full-time with my parents and my mom homeschooled my, my sister and I. And I got to see, now, even though I was growing up in small town, West Virginia, we'd go and do these crusades in the inner cities of America. I mean, we'd travel with Brother Shambuck. My father traveled on his own, set up his tent, and we'd go into the inner cities of America. And I'd be, you know, in the Bronx and Brooklyn, and, you know, I, I'd be in Newark, New Jersey, and Providence, Rhode Island, and, you know, all these different cities. And so I, I actually could see things that were bigger than where I was growing up that I didn't grow up just seeing small town West Virginia. I, grew, I went and I could see the large scale of what's possible in cities and what, you know all the things that are available, all the things that are out there. Now it's easier than ever. Of course, with the internet, there are things you can, you can Google it, you can look at it, you can print it out. Keep big things in front of your face. You're not called for small. In fact, put that in the comments. I'm not called to be small and you're absolutely not. I'm not called to be small. And if you want to excel, if you want to level up, you have to have a, a vision. You've got to have a big vision. What's possible in my life? What's possible in my life? Because what happens to many people is they just get stuck in what this is what me and my family have always had. All the answers, you know, my mother and father, this is what they had. My grandmother and my grandfather, this is what they had. You know, somebody was telling me recently that there's, uh, a phrase, and uh, I don't know if Ben or Jessica are, are on, but there's a phrase that people would say, don't get above your raising. Don't get above your raising. And what happens is people end up feeling like, oh, look at them. They've got out, they got out of the town they grew up in. They went to college. They got a job. They got a career. And now they're trying to act like they're all, they're big and they're getting more, you know, you know it's like offensive to the people that went before you. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. They should be happy for you to increase. They should be happy for you to expand. They should be happy that you're going places that they never went. In fact, one thing that our pastor, Bishop Rick Thomas, says, I like this. He says, my ceiling will be your floor. My ceiling will be your floor. That's powerful. Every generation should be greater than the last generation. Every generation should build upon what the last generation did. We shouldn't all start at ground zero. I thank God for my grandfather and my grandmother, but I didn't start where they started. I thank God for my mother and my father, but I didn't have to start where they started. Thank God for that. My children, though, will not start where I started. They'll start on another level because of God's faithfulness. Every generation should increase. Every single generation should increase. You should have that vision board so that you can continually keep in front of your face what is possible. What are you going to put your eyes on? What are you going to let fill your eye gate? What are you going to listen to? What are you going to allow to be what you're... Because understand something. What, whatever your focus is, that's what you'll move toward. Whatever your focus is, that's what you will move toward. That's so powerful. If you can get that. Whatever your focus is, that's what you'll move toward. Absolutely. And so I'm putting my focus on big things because I believe God is able to do big things in my life and in your life. The Bible says so. 
Ephesians 3.20, now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly and above all that you could ask or think according to the power that works in you. So you're called not to be small, but to continue to grow, expand, increase, because you have a God that does more than you can even imagine, and he'll do it on your behalf. Put big things in front of your eyes. Number nine, get this in your spirit. Number nine, ask God for an idea and create an alternate stream of income with it. That's number nine. Force yourself in this year coming to create a stream of income that is not connected to your job. And watch what God will do. Ask God to give you an idea and then use that idea to create an alternate stream of income that is not connected to your job. If you want to level up, you can't depend on the system you're in. You know, it's like someone said one time, you know, brother, I'm, I'm on a fixed income. I remember that somebody said that to Brother Shambach one time. I'm on a fixed income. He said, who fixed it? We're going to unfix it. Who fixed it? We're going to unfix it. Yeah, don't just, if you are always dependent upon, and of course, you, I'm sure you know this, if you're always dependent upon what you spend your time to do, you can only ever be as blessed or you can only ever increase as much as what you can trade your time for. Set yourself up to where you can do something that you're not trading all of your time in order to continue to make that money. And God will bless you. God will bless you. God will give you ideas that are so mind-blowing that people will, they'll just shake their head. I remember reading, and I wrote about this, and I, I logged it all in the book, one of the books that I wrote. But I remember reading about this man who started a business making hunting blinds because God gave him an idea while he was in his tree stand hunting deer to go home and start making trees and rocks out of styrofoam using a wire cutter. He did it, painted those, got patents, started to build hunting blinds that looked like big rotted out tree stumps, ended up going and making them, went to a hunting expo, set up a booth, and a man that owned hunting land in Texas saw his blind and said, man, these are amazing. I want to buy them all for my land. The man became a multimillionaire because he had one idea from God, one idea from God to produce an alternate stream of income that's not connected to your job. Or maybe you're retired. It's not connected to your social security and your retirement fund. What can God give you? You're not limited. You're not limited. And, and let me tell you something. If you're watching me and you're in retirement age or beyond or you're nearing retirement age, you're not done. You're not done. You're in the best, think about this. You're in the best position you've ever been in because now you're the wisest you've ever been. You're the most experienced that you've ever been. You have the most skills that you've ever had. I mean, you're in the best position that you've ever been right now. At that age of 60, at that age of 65, at that age of 70, you right now are in the best position you've ever been. Plus, you have a work ethic right now that none of the, none of the young generation has. So you have actually a leg up on those that are younger right now. They don't have your experience. They don't have your work ethic. They don't have your skills. They don't have your mindset. They don't have all the wisdom that you've compiled over the years. You're in an excellent position. And you're not done. You know, retirement doesn't mean that you've given up on life. Just because you are not at your previous job doesn't mean you can't still produce. Doesn't mean God won't still bless you. Don't ever look at retirement as I'm done. The moment you're done, you're done. You hear what I'm saying? The moment you're done, you're done. Don't be that person. You're not finished yet. In fact, your best days are ahead of you. Never ending increase should be your story. No question about it. Never ending increase should be your story. And so ask God to give you an idea. And watch as, as at 65 years old, at 70 years old, God gives you an idea and boom, an alternate stream of income hits you. And then what would you do if you made another $2 million, $3 million, $5 million at 70 years old with an idea God gave you that you were just diligent to pursue. All these things are possible. You are not finished. I would remind you 
of what <clears throat> Caleb said when he was 85. He said, I'm stronger today than I was when I was 45. Stronger today. He was ready to go and take the promise at his, I mean, that 85 years old, you're ready to go. You're not done. Let me encourage you. You're not done. Number 10, very important, schedule planned fasts, times of fasting and prayer throughout your year. Now, of course, we always begin the year with 21 days of fasting and prayer, but schedule times of fasting and prayer throughout your year. These are times when you hear from God. These might be one of the times that you get the idea from God you're believing for. But schedule times of fasting and prayer throughout your year and then press in. And let me just say this to you. There's never going to be a convenient time to fast, ever. There's always a birthday party. There's always a dinner. There's always an anniversary. There's always a holiday. There will never be a convenient time to fast, ever. But you've got to do it anyway because Jesus expected his followers to fast at some point. At some point. If you, ha if you don't have it yet, I released a book called A Complete Guide to Biblical Fasting. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Kindle. You can get it at shop.miracleword.com. It's called A Complete Guide to Biblical Fasting. I outline every single thing in that book that I wish I knew when I was younger. But I went through the whole Bible and actually took everything I could that the Bible teaches about fasting and prayer, put it into one book. We list every fast in the Bible, types of fasts, people that fasted, what fasting does, why you should fast, everything, everything. And it'll help you because this is one of the spiritual disciplines that Jesus expects. What does it do? It puts you in position to receive from God. No question about it. It puts you in position to receive from God. So number 10, schedule planned fasts, times of fasting and prayer throughout the entire year. Don't let the 21 days of fasting and prayer in January be the only time that you fast and pray. Don't let that be the only time. Spend time throughout your year fasting and praying. You know, one of the things that I wrote in the book is that if you would just fast three days every month, think about this, three days every month, then you will have fasted for a tithe of the year, 36 days of a 365-day year. That's a tithe of your year in fasting and prayer. That's just three days a month. That's very easy to do. Very easy to do. Schedule those times. Watch what God will do as you press in through fasting and prayer. Uh, number 11, very, very important. Become a diligent student of the Bible. Hear me on this. Become a diligent student of the Bible. Every Christian needs to be a diligent student of the Bible. I'm telling you, this was such a burning thing in my heart. I was actually in a parking lot in Atlanta, Georgia, sitting in a rental truck, and I was praying one afternoon. And I was irritated because I was seeing so many young people that would come to church, come to the revivals, go to the youth camps, and they'd be on fire for God and all this. And then, and then they'd go to some liberal university, and some uh, professor somewhere would give one lecture, talk them out of the Bible, talk them out of Christianity, you know, whatever. And they'd come back, they've lost their fire, they've lost their hunger, all of that. And I said, God, I'm tired of that. I want to see young people on fire for God and know what they believe and know why they believe what they believe. Only thing I heard back from the Lord in prayer was, why don't you do something about it? And so we launched Miracle Word University. Miracle Word University. It can be found at miraclewordu.com the letter U. And I just wanted to start teaching things that uh, would help people understand what the Bible teaches. Why do we believe what we believe about prayer? Why do we believe what we believe about faith and about healing? And I went through just topically. And then we started Bible study made simple. You know, how do we study the Bible properly? We've put these resources out to help you become a diligent student of the Bible a diligent student of the Bible. The, every blessing God has for you is literally locked up in the scripture. Every blessing, everything he has for your life is inside his word. It's a treasure trove for every Christian. I, the thing is, 
If you don't know what's in it, you can never access it. If you don't know what the Bible says, it can never be your story, ever. So you've got to become a diligent student of the Bible. No question about it. And I want to encourage you, if you've not checked it out before, go check out miraclewordu.com. We have all kinds of different things in there to build your faith, but to teach you to become a diligent student of the Bible. So vital. One of my favorite things, get this, if you want to level up, set, this is by the way, number 12, set new generosity goals. Set new generosity goals. Yes, set new generosity goals. I'm going to give more this year than I gave last year to the Lord. I'm going to be more of a blessing this year than I was last year. Think about that. I'm going to do more. That's what you, That needs to be your goal. I'm going to give more to God this year than I did last year. I'm going to continually move forward in my life of generosity in the kingdom. Why? Because the Bible says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that will he also reap. There's a system called sowing and reaping that when I give, God will bless me for my giving. There's no question about it. You can't sow seed and not have a harvest come back. It's impossible. And so I've made up my mind that if that's how God works, I'm going to do more than I've ever done. And the Bible goes on to say he gives seed to the sower. God gives seed to the sower. So you don't even have to go find your own seed. God will put seed in your hand if you're faithful to sow it. No question about that. And so I'm going to set new generosity goals. Maybe there's something that you've never done before and you're like, Lord, I'm going to do this in this year. Maybe you're, maybe you're saying, well, you know what? There, I've never in my life sown a $1,000 seed or something like that, whatever it might be for you. I've never sown $5,000 into the kingdom of God before at one time. This is the year I'm going to do that. I've never sown 10,000. Maybe you're a businessman. You have a business. I've never given God a hundred thousand dollars. And this is going to be the year that I break that. And I, my first hundred thousands going into the kingdom, whatever it is, set new generosity goals for yourself. Because see, the more, remember this verse, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse six, the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. And those that come to God must believe that he exists and that he's a rewarder of who? Everybody? No, he's only a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. The more you diligently seek God, the more he rewards you. That's Bible. The more you diligently seek God, the more he rewards you. And so I'm making up my mind. This is my year to give more than I've ever given. I'm going to, I used to say this all the time. We used to call it kingdom slice. If you looked at your finances as a pie chart, you've got this much going to mortgage your rent, car payment, insurance, entertainment, vacation, whatever that is. I want the largest slice that's going out to go to the kingdom. I want the largest slice going out to go to the kingdom. It's my kingdom slice. And it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger because God's giving me larger seeds than I've ever had before. Set a generosity goal. Number 13, destroy insecurities and share your faith. Another goal you should set is your soul winning goal. It's another goal you should set. How many people do I want to share my faith with in this year and bring them into the kingdom of God? How many people do I want to see saved through my life this year? Every Christian is called to be a soul winner. Every single Christian is called to bring people to Jesus. So, as I said before, get specific. How many people do I want to win to Jesus this year? You know, our, our, at our church, uh, we have teams that go out on the street and uh, one of the things that they have the individuals do before we start the actual day of soul winning is to list how many people do you want to win to Jesus today? How many people are you believing to pray that prayer of salvation with today? And they may say, well, I'm believing for five people today. Okay, well, if you're going to believe for five people, then you obviously you can't talk to only three people today. You got to talk to at least five people. So it sets a clear goal. How many souls do I want to see saved through my life this year? Did you know that the Bible says that uh, God, who is the one who's the Lord of the harvest, 
he pays the reapers wages. Pays them wages. That means there's a blessing attached to soul winning. There's a blessing attached to bringing people into the kingdom of God. So destroy insecurities. I don't care. You know, if you got to just come up with how am I going to break the ice? How am I going to talk to somebody? Even if it's just sharing your testimony, you know, telling what happened to you, how God touched you, how God saved you. Start those conversations and watch as God uses you to bring people to Jesus. It's powerful. Number 14, I'll give you two more. Number 14. This is this is a this was a very mind-blowing thing when I when I heard this recently. But number 14 is this. Focus on others. Please put that in the comments. Number 14. If you want to level up in the new year, focus on others. Focus on others. Focus on praying for them, giving thanks for them, encouraging them, helping them grow. I was, re- I was listening to something uh, the other day, and I-, I-, I had no idea that this was even a thing. But I was listening to Dr. Jordan Peterson, uh, and he was talking about, and of course, if you-, if you don't know who he is, he's a clinical psychologist. He was talking about something that's uh, psychologically based. He said, if you were to put a bunch of people in a room and record their conversations, uh, and listen to how many times they referred to themselves. The people who refer to themselves more than others, far more than others, are the ones that are the most likely to be depressed. What they're finding, the more self-centered you are, the more self-focused you are, the more that heaviness comes on you. The more inter, I'm all, it's always about me. It's always, what can I get? Where's mine? How come I don't have that? The more self-focused you are, the more self-focused you are, they said the more likely you are to be depressed, what we call heaviness, what we call, you know, that anxiety hits you, whatever it is. Focus on others. You know why? Because you're called to other people. When I was growing up, uh, there used to be a saying that we had, and we used the word joy as an acronym. You might remember this from children's church, Jesus, others, you. In that order, Jesus, others, you, joy. Focus on others. Number 15, final one, rest properly. Rest properly. It's a reward for those who produce. Please put that in the comments. Rest is a reward for those who produce. You got to get that. Rest is a reward for those who produce. Say, what do you mean by that? Not everybody's entitled to rest. Not everybody is entitled, you know, if you're lazy and you don't do anything, what what are you resting for? What are you resting from? (laughs) Rest is a reward for those that produce. The Bible says in Psalm 127 and verse 2, God gives his loved ones rest. God gives his loved ones rest. No question about it. The Lord dealt with me one time about this. I was, I mean, I was going hard. I was going hard night after night after night, week after week after week, and I was in Brazil, and I could barely, I mean, I literally, I could barely uh, muster the strength. I was praying, Lord, just give me the strength to minister to your people. Just give me the strength. Give me the, you know, the words to speak. You know, let there be a flow of the anointing. And the Lord specifically said to me, you're not my only worker. That hit me like cold water in the face. You're not my only worker. And then he took me to Mark chapter six and showed me that after the disciples came back and told Jesus all that they had done and taught, all that they had produced for the kingdom, Jesus didn't even refer to their work. He just said, now let's go away and rest for there's been so much coming and going. We've not even had a chance to eat. Jesus focused on their rest. He focused on their rest. If you are literally always going, if you're trying to, if you're wearing yourself out, you're not going to be any good to anybody. People think they're, they're doing God some kind of a service because, you know, they sleep three hours a night, four hours a night, or, you know, they're going hard and they don't, they don't ever rest themselves. No, even Jesus rested himself. Even Jesus went out into the wilderness and rested himself and got alone with his father. Very important because, as again, remember this, your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you want to level up, you've got to be ready to do the thing God's called you to do. And as you do, this body, this temple has to be rested enough to do it. I'm telling you, if you'll do these 15 things, if you'll make these changes, if you will make these decisions, 
you can expect to see supernatural progress. These are all biblical principles. These are not self-help principles. These are not business ideas. These are all biblical principles. God instituted these things so that we, his children, could move forward with momentum. We're supposed to see never-ending increase. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 18, the path of the just or the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn and it shines brighter and brighter until full day. One translation says the perfect day. Another translation says you're called to have never-ending increase.